throughout the ages of church history, the Lord has been kind and gracious to us. He has been gracious in the fact that he has given those who have come before us, who help and labor to find ways to summarize the Christian faith. Believe it or not, you know, as, as much as hopefully we're immersing ourselves in the 66 books of the Bible and, and that is teaching us, there's still times where we struggle. How do we summarize these thoughts? How, how do we put these together from these various places? And the Lord has been kind to give us a means of this. And the means of it is through the catechisms. The catechisms are a great tool for us in the Christian life to teach us, to, to sum up what the whole of the Bible says on particular matters. You've got the larger and shorter Westminster catechisms. You also have the Heidelberg Catechism. And the reason I draw these out this morning is we need to consider one of these this morning as we consider a matter before us here in Matthew. And that comes in the 95th question of the Heidelberg Catechism. What is idolatry? The answer? Idolatry is having or inventing something in which one trusts in place of or alongside of the only true God who has revealed himself in his word. This is an important question for us to think and ask this morning in this 95th question of the Heidelberg Catechism because it's at the heart of the passage we come to here in Matthew's Gospel of chapter 6 beginning in verse 19 through 24. We think of idols, we think typically of those little statues made of, of, that are carved out and bowed before, but the reality is these are not the only idols in which we bow our hearts to. I love how Brad Bigney identifies an idol in his book, Gospel Treason. An idol is anything or anyone that captures our hearts, minds, and affections more than God. Let me repeat that. An idol... Oops. An idol is anything or anyone that captures our hearts, minds, and affections more than God. Therefore, idols can be something from wealth. It can be a statute. It can be anything that takes the place of God in our hearts, in our affections, in our desires. And that's what we come to here in Matthew 6, 19. So if you have a Bible, I invite you there uh, to open up to Matthew 6, 19 through 24. If you do not have a copy of God's Word, you can grab the Red Pew Bible there in front of you, and it's on page 964 this morning is where our passage begins. We continue our study here through the Gospel of Matthew. We pick back up where we left off two weeks ago here, jumping next verse up, verse 19. As we've been working our way through this gospel account, we've seen Jesus being the one who is identified as the Son of God, the fulfillment of promises to Abraham, to David. We've seen this Jesus as he begins his ministry in a historical narrative presentation. The first four chapters teach us history. This is who Jesus is. This is about him. Then coming into the Sermon on the Mount, beginning in verse, or chapter 5 all the way through 7, it transitions to a more didactic means of teaching, which means that out of imperatives begin to come in commands for us as Christians, particularly commands for God's people. Here's how you're to live. Here's how you're to live if you are to be the truly blessed ones, the ones who delight in the rule of God, and enter his happiness. That's what we've been working our way through, particularly looking then after Matthew 5, 17 through 20, this call to a greater righteousness. So what does this greater righteousness look like? Well, we've seen it overturns everything of our lives, not just an outward act, but an inner heart matter of righteousness. We've seen this changes the way then we go about prayer and fasting. It's not for show. It's not so that man can praise us. It's before a holy God. And this continues this morning, even in what has our hearts' allegiance. 
So hear God's word here then from Matthew 6, beginning in verse 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If in the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. So what in the world do we do with this? Just uh, tipping my hand for what's coming. Matthew 6, 19 through 34 are really one unit. But it's helpful for us here to break these two separate units to flow together. So there is some continual thought here. Just a, a heads up in what's coming. These two will tie back together as particularly in what we look at next week. And here's what I think the main idea of Matthew 6, 19 through 24 is. And this text is, Lord willing, the main idea of this sermon. If we are to serve God, our heart and I must be wholly given to Him alone. If we are to serve God, our heart and our I must be wholly given to Him alone. We're going to unfold this in three points flowing from this. Point number one, the treasure of your heart. The treasure of your heart is covering verses 19 through 21. Point number two, the health of your eye. The health of your eye. This covering verses 22 and 23. And point number three, the master whom you serve. The master whom you serve is covering verse 24. The treasure of your heart, the health of your eye, the master whom you serve. Point number one, the treasure of your heart. Our passage opens considering two locations of where our treasures are stored up or literally treasured up. Where are we treasuring up our treasures? Two different locations, one negative, one positive. Verse 19, we see the negative. Do not lay up or do not treasure up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Then the positive, verse 20, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven or treasure up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. Why this comparison? Because the reality is found and given there in verse 21. Where our treasure is, our heart is. Wherever we are treasuring up our treasures, so will our hearts be. We think in treasuring up treasures here on earth somehow that these Treasures will make us happy and joyful. When Jesus here is trying to teach us and, and turn us that treasures are not to be here of the earth. They're to be stored up in heaven where they last. That's the, the big picture here. But let us consider here more of what Jesus is teaching us here. Starting with this treasures of earth. We read again here in verse 19. As it starts, do not treasure up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy. Where moth and rust destroy. When we hear this term of rust, we begin to instantly think of metals being broken down. That's a good translation. But it's actually, there's more going on here that we're going to unfold. Jesus here is trying to paint this picture that it is the minor things we're tempted more to treasure up. Brothers and sisters, we hear this, you shouldn't treasure up treasures on earth. We typically think of the fancy things, those that have all the money to do whatever. We think of the nice car, the fancy house, 
the Yacht Club membership, all of these things. But Jesus actually here is getting to the everyday type of person. He's not going after just the, the wealthy here. As he talks about this of moth and rust, he's talking about the more practical things of life that we begin to treasure. Think about it this way. He's talking here to Middle Eastern culture. A people whose houses are made of clay. Not wood, not brick, clay. You don't have the metals common in this ancient world. So therefore, when it says and talks about moth and rust, it's not talking about the fancy, expensive metals that are, are corroding. It's not having in mind the rust that's building up on someone's F-150 or, or Chevy Silverado. It's not talking about that kind of thing being eaten up. Because here, underlined, while we have a good and faithful translation here in the ESV and, and other translations, there's actually a more deeper wordplay going on here. We have here in what we translate as, uh, sorry, I keep losing my place. We have here the Greek word brosis for rust. Rust is actually talking about that of eating up. But not in the sense of metals, being eaten up by rust. It's more laying out the finer things of clothing, of practical things being eaten up. <clears throat> Think about it, Northwood's body. What is common around here? Because we live in woods, mice, rodents, they get into these houses and begin to eat up even the basic things of clothing. This is what's being referred to in the underlying. It's even that of clothing is treasured up and not to be treasured. The reason drawing this out is because we need to see what it is that is tempted to capture our hearts of basic need. And basic materials that we take for granted, we're tempted to treasure because we think in having them, we are more comfortable. And that's not what God and Jesus is telling us. The Son of God is not teaching us this. He's teaching us, beware of these types of treasures. Consider Achan from Joshua 7, 21 through 26, where we read, When I saw among the spoil a beautiful cloak from Shinar, and 200 shekels of silver, and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels. Then I coveted them and took them. And see, they are hidden in the earth inside my tent with the silver underneath. So Joshua sent messengers, and they ran to the tent. And behold, it was hidden in his tent with the silver underneath. And they took them out of the tent and brought them to Joshua and to all the people of Israel. And they laid them down before the Lord. And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, and the silver, and the cloak, and the bar of gold, and his sons, and daughters, and his oxen, and donkeys, and sheep, and his tent, and all that he had, and they brought them up to the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why did you bring trouble on us? The Lord brings trouble on you today. And all Israel stoned him with stones. They burned them with fire and stoned them with stones. And they raised over him a great heap of stones that remains to this day. You see, friends, the gold may catch our hearts, but so can the cloak. The cloak can capture our hearts and cause us to treasure it of daily goods and provisions more than we do that of God. Our heart can be more on the practical day-to-day -day where idolatry begins to build on our hearts, where we find more comfort in these things than we do a holy and sovereign. Friends, this is a warning from the Lord Jesus to not treasure up these basic things because they can be taken away and destroyed by everyday life. Not only can they though, be eaten up by moth and eaten and destroyed, but thieves break in and steal. Thieves break in and steal even the most basic of items. Again, we're tempted to think of the gold and, and the jewelry being stolen, but Hear this word spoken in Proverbs 6, 30, and 31. 
People do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy his appetite when he is hungry. But if he is caught, he will pay sevenfold. He will give all the goods of his house. That of being stolen is even that of common things such as food and clothing. Friends, do you see the danger if our treasures are these earthly things, even of basic means? Again, this ties in where we're going next week, uh, of verse 25 through 34, of, of not being anxious about these things that God provides. But now we need to see first, why are we so tempted to be anxious? It's because we put our heart and our comfort and our joy in these everyday material things. We need to be aware of where our treasures are and our heart. Instead, the Lord tells us, the Lord Jesus here in verse 20, lay up, store up yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. While we do not see particularly in this passage what are these treasures that we're to store up in heaven, we begin to see this down in verse 33. Look there with me at, at Matthew 6, verse 33. To seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Now we're going to unfold that next week, but we need to begin to see what is at stake here and what is being called is to pursue a treasure of the things of the kingdom of God, the things that Jesus will go on to teach throughout Matthew's gospel account, things such as God's kingdom being that of eternal life there in Matthew 19, of, of the master's joy in Matthew 25, and the kingdom itself there also in Matthew 25. These are the treasures we are to treasure up in heaven, the things of God's kingdom, namely that of eternal life and the kingdom itself. How are we laboring for treasures? Are we treasuring up the things that are temporary and that will quickly fade or the lasting things? I love what one commentator here points out. He writes, we lay up treasures in heaven by investing in God's causes, in God's people. The effects of such investments last forever. We store treasures in heaven by worshiping God growing in knowledge and grace and growing in love for God and neighbor. Financially, we store treasures in heaven by using money for kingdom causes, by giving money to the church, to missions, to Christian schools, to the poor. When we store treasures in heaven by investing our money in God's people, our investment will bear dividends for eternity. Friends, what is controlling us? What has our heart's allegiance? Is it ultimately the treasures of this world, or is it the treasures of the world to come? Does our heart reveal that we love this world, or we love God? What is God's call for us? Well, it's found in the great Shema, Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Christian, then we must labor to keep our hearts focused on God, to keep it with all diligence, to love God and God alone and not the treasures of this world that will soon fade away. Yes, they are necessary. More on that to come. But we need to see God must be with where our heart lies. We must love him above all. Point number two, the health of your eye. As with our hearts needing to be kept and guarded, so we must examine our eye. You know, it's the emphasis of eye rather than eyes. It's not necessarily looking at our literal figurative eyes here, of which we see, which, by the way, obviously I need corrective lenses for. My eyes are not very healthy, but more importantly, is my eye healthy? Is my eye, my focus, where I am zoomed in on for attentiveness, is that healthy? We see here again in verse 22 and 23, these things unfolded, a comparison. Verse 22, though, the positive. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your body will be full of light. 
Verse 23, the negative. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? Friend, the question is, is our eye healthy? Is looking at it, is it singular focused? Is it focused on God and God alone? Is he the one that we are setting our eye on? Is he what we have our attentiveness on? If so, then is our eye healthy and rightly in seeing who God is as our good and caring Father? Is our eye healthy and full of light in recognizing our own sin and need of God's grace? Are we dependent upon the Father and seeing that rightly? Is our eye healthy and full of light and being devoted to God alone? Or is it bad? Is it full of darkness? Do we reject our need for dependence upon our God? Is it our eye bad and full of darkness by casually walking in sin as if it is okay and acceptable? These are the comparisons we begin to see here. But again, as good of an English translation we have, there, there's something more underlying here. And I don't do this to, to show off skills, but to, to let us in the imagery here being trying to communicate by the original author here. We see this use of healthy and bad. We see there in verse 22, so if your eye is healthy, and then verse 23, but if your eye is bad, that doesn't fully capture what's going on here. Again, looking to the original, the underlying, we see in, in the word translated healthy is the Greek word apus, and then in the Greek word that we translate bad is paneros. Apos means this more single, uh, straightforward, sincere focus. It's not just is it healthy, is it singular focus, is it straightforward, or is it distracted? Or this word paneros, Evil, degenerate, and vicious is the underlying. Or we could even argue that it, it could be capturing and playing on this straight singular in a way of divided and double vision. So Christian, what is being at stake here in asking, is our eye healthy or is it bad? Are we singular focused on God? Or do we have our eyes in double vision and focus on evil things or things besides God. An unhealthy eye is focused on multiple things. It may have God in a place, in a corner, but it's not given any more of that corner than necessary because it's got its eyes here on the world and the things of this world. Christian, do we have a good or a bad eye? Do we have a healthy or an unhealthy eye? What is our focus. And if our eyes are evil, how great Jesus goes on to say there in verse 23 again, your, uh, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? If our eyes are split between, or our eyes split between God and this world, how great is that darkness dwelling within us? The issue again is where are our where is our eye? Fixed? I love John Calvin here. Sorry, I'm forgetting to change slides. Here are these words from Calvin to help draw this out. The substance of the present statement is that men go wrong through carelessness because they do not keep their eye fixed as they ought to do on the proper object. You see, the health of our eye depends on the object of its attention. We either will focus it on God and have a healthy eye, a singular focused eye, or we will focus it on God and something else, and therefore it is bad, it is unhealthy, it is evil. Why? Because our eye is not clearly focused. Our eye cannot be focused on two things and see them both clearly and rightly. Therefore, we must begin to Seek God's aid in this. Because we're tempted, if we're to have a healthy eye, we're tempted to say, all right, I've got to muster up strength and refocus my eye and my own strength of my own account. But friends, that misses the gospel. 
That misses the fact that Jesus is not calling us to do something from our own strength. He is calling us to seek the Father's dependence. And A, as we seek a singular focus I. Teenagers, this part may be familiar to you. You heard this a few weeks ago in your Psalm 119 study. In Psalm 119, 1 through 8, what is being declared, it's a desire to be blameless, a desire to keep the testimonies of the Lord, a desire to seek the Lord with a whole heart, a desire to praise the Lord and not forsake Him, to have eyes fixed on the commandments of the Lord. But how does the psalmist go on to, to do this? The psalmist recognizes I can't do this of my own. I can't be blameless of my own. So how? By guarding it according to the word of the Lord. In verse 9. And then it goes on to, to make these requests. And Christian, let these be our requests for a single focused eye. Psalm 119.10. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. Psalm 119.15, I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. Psalm 119.18, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. Just a side note here, Christian, if you don't memorize Psalm 119.17-20, through 20, let me encourage you to do just that. If you need a verse to begin to memorize as a Christian, Memorize Psalm 119, 17 through 20, which is a prayer for us to have our eyes and our hearts open to the Lord, even as we come to read his word on a daily basis, as we come to prepare for worship. Let us memorize that passage and put it into practice. But let us hear from verse 18, ask the Lord to open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things out of his law. Psalm 119, 37, turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. Brothers and sisters, is this the cry of our heart as we pray to God, asking God to give us that singular focus on Him, asking us to be fixated on Him and Him alone because He is the one we are to love. Let that be the prayers of our hearts. But all of this comes down to, to our third point this morning. Which master do we serve? Which master do we serve? Verse 24. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. You cannot serve God and money. Why do we need to examine where our treasures are and what our eye is fixed upon? Because these will determine whom we serve. If our treasures of, of this world and earthly treasures, if our eye is divided and not singularly set on God, we will, sooner or later, and in increasingly evil ways, serve mine rather than God. We can't serve both. Notice what Jesus teaches here. For either you will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. Friends, if money is what drives up us, if we get so fixated on the need for earthly treasures, and, and that's what drives every thought of every day, if that's what begins to creep into our hearts and say, money dictates what kind of job I take. Money dictates how I go about my week. Money dictates everything. Do you realize what we are serving is not God? It's money. We're controlled and run by money because we are so consumed about all the things of our... And again, this isn't just talking about the wealthy. This is talking about us who barely make it in to our week to week in that sense. This is talking about the poorest of the poor. This applies to everyone. We're tempted to serve money instead of God. We must be aware of this warning. We must see the call to serve God and God alone. Because it is not money that can buy us true happiness. Just this week, I, I heard it or saw it going around of uh, uh, Shaquille O'Neal talking about having a thousand square foot home that is completely empty. 
all the fame, all the fortune, and an empty house because his wife and kids are, are not there with him. He put all his attention on money. Money cannot buy us happiness and contentment, though we may think it does. And that's why we labor for it and serve it so often. We think by having more of it, we will serve it, and it will bring us joy and contentment, friends. It does not. But why do we serve the Lord? It's not to earn God's faith. We don't, aren't called as disciples of Jesus to serve God out of means of earning our salvation. No, it's in response to a salvation already won on the cross. We serve God because we realize as Christians we are not our own, but belong wholly to our triune God. We serve Him because Jesus bled and died on the cross to purchase us from sin Settling the debt that was owed with Satan, where Satan could have that claim on us as, no, this one belongs to me because he or she has rejected your ways, God. Therefore, they've sinned and transgressed, they're mine. And Jesus shedding his blood on the cross, he paid that debt. Therefore, Satan had no claim on us who have trusted in this Jesus. And because this Jesus died and rose again, Beating sin and death, we have hope. We have that of eternal life, and therefore we serve God. We are to serve God out of response to that good news, to that gospel message, that we are not our own, but Jesus has bled to purchase us from our sin. Friend. As we even come to the Lord's Supper table this morning, remember that. It's a meal of remembrance. The payment's already done. There's not, not a sacrifice. There's not coming to an altar this morning. It's paid. It's done. We're remembering that. Let us remember then, too, who do we choose to serve? The one that we think promises us freedom and joy or the one who sent his only begotten son to die on a cross to free us from the penalty of sin. Friends, let us look to that. And friend, if you're here this morning and you don't know this Jesus, you think this money somehow can be a better master and you can get more out of serving it, let me tell you, it will not. Money will fail you. You will, just as Shaq, find yourself hopeless in the midst of trying to serve money. You need to see your greatest need is Christ. You need to see the one you need to serve is the one who's willing to give everything in order to purchase you. Turn from allegiance to money and turn to God and God alone and serve Him by believing in His beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Repent and believe today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank You. We thank You for Your grace and Your mercy to us. Father, we pray, Lord, that as we think through this, Lord, that we would constantly examine our hearts and our eye on what are they treasuring, what are they focused on. Are they focused on the here and the now, Lord, which will all fade away? Or are we focused on you and your eternal kingdom, which is far better? We pray that you will help us. Help us through your word. Help us in the gathering together of one another. Stir one another to these truths so that we may love you and love you alone and serve you alone. Father, we pray and we ask this in Jesus' name.